Hi, welcome back everyone to uh, the ISI uh, National Language uh, Seminar Series. For the fall semester, we uh, are we have Xin Ya today, who is a final year PC student who works with Kartik uh, Naran Simhan at Princeton LP Group. His research focus on, focuses on language agents and is supported, and he is supported by the Harold W. Dodds uh, World Fellowship from Princeton. Today, he'll be talking on formulating and evaluating language agents. Super excited for his talk. Um, and without further ado, let's get started. Cool. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. And uh, glad to be here to talk to you guys uh, remotely. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, formulating and evaluating language agents, right? But, but for, first, what is language agents? Uh, so I will just define language agent to be any system that use large language models to interact with the word. So, uh, and, uh, and I, I'm sure you guys have heard, you know, the term agent, uh, recently, very frequently. And, uh, and, and it's actually a, not a well, well defined like field yet. You know, we have a lot of different terms. To, to 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 talk about the same thing, right? I, I call this language agent, but different people call this different things. But uh, we all agree this is a kind of agent that uses the uh, language model to interact with uh, environments and, and solve problems. Uh, obviously, we have you know a lot of papers already. You know, I recently collected a repo, and there are like hundreds of papers recently just talking about you know how to design different agents for different problems, you know. And obviously this area has seen a lot of like industrial interests, right? Something like ChatGPT plugin or generative search or or you know, those like a personal assistant, copilot. A lot of those things are based on this idea of language agents, right? Like autonomous agents that are acting in interacting in like a language environment. Uh so despite all the interest and all the hype and all the ideas, uh, what what is the problem of this uh, domain? So today I want to talk about two aspects that I think are kind of understudied and uh, are kind of the caveat that, that we should think more. So first, I think we are in lack of a rigorous series to formulate and uh, describe and uh, compare different agents. Like what is the definition of a language agent, right? And uh, how how can we make sense of all the hundreds of papers nowadays and uh, unify those efforts, you know, across different fields? And uh, and uh, what what is the future direction, right? Can can we have some theory to 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 make sense of existing agents and guide the building of uh, new agents? I think we are also. Uh, Compared to all the you know methodology ideas, we are kind of uh, in a lack of benchmarks. Uh, so if you ask yourself, you know, if I want to build an agent today, if I want to you know build an agent with GB four today, what task should I should I do? That turns out to be maybe even harder than than how to build an agent, because if you think about a lot of the existing NLP tasks, you know, some are too easy to solve. Uh, not everyone can do robotics, right? Those physical interaction is hard. Uh, how do we do evaluation nowadays? It is also going through like a paradigm shift, right? We're seeing increased use of using GPT-4 to evaluate tasks or, or RLHF, all those new things, right? Uh, so how can we uh, evaluate those agents? So uh, today I'm gonna talk about these two directions. Okay, so let's talk about uh, formulation first. Uh, you know, like naively, you will think it's a very simple concept, right? Language agent. You just put a language agent, put a language model, uh, to interact with the environment, right? Like, what is what is so hard about it? But uh, the the hard thing is, you know, language model itself is just a machine that turns input into output, right? It does not control itself. You need to write extra code to control the language model. And uh, how do you control the language model to interact with the environment? There are many different ways and that leads to other complexities, right? So uh, just to give a motivating example, right? So uh, React is a 
it's a work that I did last year, and and today it could be seen as a very simple language agent, right? So the idea is, if you directly you know interact with a environment using something like this, right? Like a action observation, action action observation kind of format, where you know some environment, for example, Wikipedia give you some observation, and then language model generate the action, and you keep doing the software requester generation. Sometimes it's not enough, and uh, what we show is you you need a uh, you need to also reason, right? You need to use language model to generate also thoughts to guide the the acting part. And uh, by combining the reasoning and acting, you get a very decent baseline of language agents that's now used everywhere. And uh, and uh, and it has been a basis of all the full of work, right? So just give a couple more examples. So on top of just reasoning and acting, you can also maintain a library of skills for this Minecraft game, right? And then you can uh, do self-reflection to to improve your action, right? You can retrieve from the memory or the skill library, like what is the best action I can do right now? And uh, I can update my memory with, with new procedures. I can do this in a curriculum. I can, you know, first, first learn how to build a sword and then use the sword to fight a zombie and do more and more complicated things. And uh, it's a really cool work in Minecraft. And, uh, you know, another example, uh, beyond just reasoning and acting, you can also, you know, maintain a memory of, you know, so so for this generative agent work, it's like a small town with 25 agents that are interacting with themselves, right? Simulating everyday human interactions. You, you need uh, also memory, you need reflection, you need uh, some kind of uh, planning, and you also need to, Combine those components in a proper way. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna talk about all the details of all the works because that's too complicated. But uh, uh, the point is, despite all the you know, uh, cool work, all the fancy ideas, all the all the all the papers, right? Uh, we are we are we're we're having too 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 many things going on, and uh, it might be overwhelming, right? So at the beginning, you have a large language model, right? You have some prompt engineering, that's fine. Then you have, you know, acting, reasoning, you have grounding, you have grounding with different environments. You have, you know, memory retrieval. Now you have self-reflection feedback, uh, memory planning, control flow, decision-making, now even multi-agent and robotics. And this field is just going on at such a speed that it's really hard to make sense of all the recent efforts and all the recent language agents across all the different problems and across all the different fields, right? RL people are doing language agents, NLP people are doing that, HCI people are doing that, like all the people are doing that in a different way, using different terms and different concepts. Uh, so it's a, it's a little bit overwhelming and uh, a question is how, 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 how do we make sense of this? Can we have a theory of all those things, right? Uh, and to draw a parallel, right? Like let's let's look at a very uh, well understood thing now, circuits. So what is this parallel, right? So if you think about like a very simple, well, if you think about a language agent nowadays, it's still within grasp because it's kind of like you have those components, you collect those components in different, in, in, in those ways, right? It's like a small circuit with different components. And this agent is just, you know, this flow of different information through different components. And uh, it's still okay to describe each part individually and, and try to make sense of the whole, right? But if you are dealing with something really complicated, right? Suppose you're, you're building a language agent on Windows, right? And there are like 10,000 different procedures, right? The agent might be something like this, right? And it involves like many, many different ways to prompt the language model or to call the language model and it'll be super complicated to understand. Worse still, it, it might be super complicated to build because like the, the current way, you know, all our PhD students are building those applications, right? So we just write code to uh, intuitively design those classes and solve components. We don't have any reusable parts or any modular design, right? We just go with our intuition and what we build are often like this, right? But uh, we want something like this, right? We want a very modular and systematic way to build those language agents and to 
to help design those language edges in the first place before even implementation, right? And uh, we know, you know, for circuits, fortunately, we have something like von Neumann architecture that uh, in a high level specify, you know, what are the components of this circuit and what does each component do and how those components should be connected in a high level, right? And uh, this helped make sense of, you know, all the crazy digital circuits, you know, from 1930s to 1940s, and it actually helped build, you know, more complicated circuits, so on and so forth. So what I'm arguing here is, if we want to make sense of all the agents that's going on nowadays, we also need to have like a system level architecture kind of picture where language model is just part of the component of this architecture. Similar to, you know, how we have a computer architecture and a CPU, uh, which is a core component, but it's also just part of the component. It's not everything. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk about this paper called Cognitive Architectures for Language Agents that give a very formal theory of language agents and uh, give a guideline of how we should build future agents. Uh, this paper is really rich. It has like 20, pa 20 pages and uh, I only have, I guess, less than 20 minutes to talk about this paper. So uh, I'm gonna briefly talk about four parts. You know, what is even cognitive architecture, right? And why it is related to language agents and how it could help us make sense of language agents. And then why we want to use it to make sense of language agents, right? What are the insights? What are the conclusions? What are the advice this view can provide to help, you know, people like us to build better agents in, in, in practice. Uh, uh, like I said, like this pa paper has 20 pages, so I highly encourage you to check out the details. So, uh, so okay, first, what is cognitive architecture, right? Uh, to go a little far into the history, uh, we first need to understand what is production system and what is symbol manipulation. And, uh, uh, so the idea is, you know, in the first half of 20th century, people realized a lot of things are just simple man manipulation. So for example, uh, mass, right? You can think of it as a former system or like a production system where you have some initial rules, for example, axioms, right? And those rules are kind of like a simple manipulation system, provide some syntax, right? So. If a rule, if a, if a string looks like X, Y, Z, you can change it to X, W, Z, and so on and so forth. So it's purely syntactical, but uh, you can use those simple manipulation rules to derive very rich theories, right? What is the foundation of math? What is the foundation of logic? What is the foundation of a computation? And even, you know, people like Chomsky use it to explain how people comprehend and acquire language. You know, Coxide people use it to explain how human cognition works, right? People think a lot of that is just simple manipulation. Uh, and then, you know, around 1950s, we have computers, right? We, we have a way to implement those uh, symbolic systems in the physical world. And uh, so if you think about something like this, right? This is a production system, right? It has four rules. It, it specifies how, like, say, AC should work, but basically, uh, once we have the computers, we now have a way to implement those symbol systems into computers. And that starts both computer science and artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, we're starting to use the symbol systems to real world problems. And uh, we're starting to have symbolic AI. And uh, because we need to interact with the word, right? You need to sense the temperature, you need to change the temperature, you need to have this IO devices, you need to have a controller, you need to have perception because you know you have a uh, many rules you need to decide a priority over rules and uh, because you have complicated information uh you need some memory to store all the information you cannot just deal with them in, in like a single cpu call and uh i'm skimming over a lot of history and detail but uh basically around the around 1980s right like uh we're seeing like a hallmark of symbolic ai where those production systems are evolving into a very complicated system called cognitive architectures. And basically each cognitive architecture is like a software with a lot of symbolic components, right? And and if you solve a problem, it has like this flow around different components. And uh, 
So you can think of the like there are at the time there are around like three hundred different content architectures, and you can think of each as like a large scale software project that are inspired by human cognition and uh, and they make a lot of different applications. Uh, but then we know it comes to the first winter of AI. Uh, why is that? Uh, because you know the world is very complicated. That means if you want to deal with real world problems, you need to write a lot of rules, and to some uh to some extent you know like there is a limit to how many rules human can write up to that limit the, the thing just got off out of control right and also you know the word is stochastic and sometimes there are always exceptions and things going on that you cannot expect but uh rules can only handle what the designers can expect so in some sense it's brittle and it's not robust to all the uh, real world cases so if we fast forward the history, you know, uh, uh, skip, you know, attic slide or whatever, if we just move forward to now, you know, now it's like a summer of AI, right? And, uh, and the, the hottest thing right now is language model. And uh, uh, you can have an input and it will give you a very reasonable output, no matter what the input is. And uh, one point we want to make is, if you think about a large language model, something like ChatGPT or GPT-4, it's really like a large implicit production system. Basically, if you give the language model a new scenario, right? I'm walking down the street, you know, today is hot, whatever. You can imagine a new scenario. It will kind of give you an implicit rule like to generate some output to deal with the input, right? It has this complicated set of implicit rules to deal with all sorts of uh situations right and uh because this new role is implicit it's not you know as fragile as something like if else rules right so uh so the point is maybe it's a good time to try to use this thing to replace all the human written rules in all the you know old symbolic ai systems uh but on the other hand you know another way we can think of this is you know now we have those large language models. They're amazing. We are building all sorts of complicated agents and projects that are dealing with all sorts of problems, right? And oftentimes, uh, there's no guidance, right? We just go with our intuition. We define our own terms. We define our own concepts. Uh, maybe it's time to start building a link between all those new advances with all the old ideas, right? Because if you think about cognitive architectures, it already provides some useful abstractions, right? It's like, you should have a memory, you should have like a decision making, so on and so forth. The point is like all the efforts recently, we can maybe guide them by applying ideas from the old insights from cognitive architectures. Okay, so what is cognitive architecture for language agents, for Koala for short? Uh, it is like a way to formulate a language agent. And uh, this figure still might look a little complicated, but I'm gonna reduce that to only three parts. And uh, my claim is once you uh, formulate, you know, what is the memory and what is the action and what's the decision of an agent, then you have described each language agent, you know, no matter it's React or it's Tree of Thought, it's, it's Voyager or whatever a recent work. So, so the first concept is called memory. And basically, you know, humans also have memory. And if you study neuroscience or COXA, you know, there are two sorts of memories, right? There's this short-term working memory that only store information that is relevant to the current decision making. And it's kind of similar to the context of language models that we're using nowadays, right? Basically, you know, there are other information uh, that you can potentially use, but uh, you're kind of maintaining this working memory in the in the in the in the context of the language model, but the point is you you should also have those like long term memories that store different things that you can potentially use, right? For example, you can store some experiences of solving previous problems that will be in an episodic memory. You can reflect on your experience and propose some knowledge, right? So it's like uh, if I deal with this problem, I should probably be careful about this situation. Those kind of reflections can be knowledge that store into semantic memory, right? And lastly, if you have the language model itself, or if you have some code to actually uh, to actually uh, ground the language engine into real problems, right? Something like Voyager, right? You have those code to actually deal with 
the game, you can store those skills kind of or language model ways into your procedural memory. So the takeaway is like uh, you should maintain a short term working memory, but uh, you should also consider modular long term memories. And once, okay, so now you have uh, those memory modules, and obviously you have some external environment defined for you, right? No matter it's like a physical word, it's internet, it's like a API, it's a, a human, it's other agent, right? You have those environments and you have those memories. What should you do, right? So uh, that's where the second concept comes in. A language agent should be defined with an action space. And here is kind of interesting if you uh, also think of RL agents, right? So think of an Atari agent. Uh, so it also has this part that interact with external environments, right? So for example, if you interact with Atari games, you might have an action space of up, down, left, right. And it's defined by the environment. It's not, not up to you, right? No matter how fancy your RL agent is. On the same environment, you won't always have the same action space. But because different language agents can have different memory modules, right? It also has this part of the internal action that interacts with internal memories. And that's the key difference between all the typical traditional RL agents, right? So if you're updating your working memory, usually with a language model, right? You're doing reasoning. For example, if you do chain of thought, you're basically augmenting your context. You're argu maintain your working memory with some kind of uh, new new information, right? And uh, if you are reading from a long-term memory, that's called retrieval, right? For example, like if I retrieve some previous task-solving experiments, a uh, use that experience into the current context, I'm doing a retrieval action. And also there's learning action. Basically, if you write to your long-term memory, that's all called learning. But remember like memory, Host the parameters of the language model and also all the knowledge experience. So there are many, many ways to do learning, right? Fine tuning a language model is just one way of learning. You can also store your experience into a memory module. That's also kind of learning. You can generate some reflections and store that into a memory. That's also kind of learning. But at the end of the day, you know, you just have these four types of actions and it's really neat. You know, it just depends on whether you're interacting with external environments or internal memories and what type of internal memory and uh, whether you're reading or writing. So now you have an action space. What should you do, right? That is handled by decision making. So basically a decision making procedure decides, you know, what action you should take. And uh, in Koala, we split all the actions that the agent take into decision cycles, similar to, you know, how computers have like the CPU cycles, right? And uh, in each decision cycle, you, uh, you first plan, then you execute. And uh, the idea is kind of like in AlphaGo, you know, you can plan, you know, if I take this move, I'll probably take that move. You can plan and simulate a lot of situations. But at the end of the day, at the end of each cycle, you need to put a piece into a board. You, you need to have a grounding action. So uh, but the, what's interesting for language agent is that there are many ways you can do planning Right, you can just simply generate an action. That's the simplest form of planning. But then you can reason, then generate an action, or you can generate multiple actions, and then you evaluate each action, or you can do this iteratively, something like tree of thought. So there are many ways to do planning where you know you apply a lot of reasoning and retrieval actions to propose, evaluate, simulate. And at the end of the cycle, you need to decide a learning and grounding action, then execute it to actually change the uh, external environment or change the long term memory. And then you will have new feedback from the memory or from the environment, and then the next cycle begins, so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of details miss, missing, but that's it. That's basically a complete theory to formulate all the language agents nowadays. And uh, you can see it is, uh, it is, it has some similar parts to, you know, all the series of RL agents, but it has this richer set because you have those structured memory, you have large language model, and you have internal actions and you have decision making in you know, a more generalized way. Uh, but why do we want to do this, right? What is the benefit of having this formulation? What is the benefit of having this theory, right? Uh, first, it could help you organize and make sense of all the existing agents, right? We have all those complicated papers and, uh, and they look completely different on the surface, right? 
But if you just formulate and organize them through Koala, you will realize, you know, their similarities and differences and their trends, right? So for example, like some 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 agents have long-term memory, some don't. You know, they have different forms of external grounding, they're grounding to different environments, they have different internal actions, right? And uh, obviously they have different decision-making procedures. It just simplifies a lot of the details and uh, you can make sense of all the agents and look at their structural kind of intrinsic similarities and differences. Uh, another example, right? So here's the part of the paper that we talk about learning. And like I, talk, like I said before, there's many ways to learning, right? Learning, if you just think of it, it's a long-term memory update. It's a really simple but very powerful kind of definition. And it unifies a lot of different things, right? Not just fine-tuning the parameters of the language model. You can also write you know, new knowledge into memory. And, uh, uh, and through this organization, you can immediately realize you know, a lot of things are missing. You know, people are focusing on one or two forms of learning. And there's a lot of like open places, open things you can do. And uh, you know, this week there's this new paper from Stanford that is, you know, a language agent can change its own code, right? That's something new. And uh, if you look at Koala, you will realize it's just a form of learning where it updates its procedural memory and it's updating its like uh, learning procedures. So it will just make sense, and uh, you will realize all the future directions immediately. So obviously, you know, in the paper we have. We have like Sorry, can I ask you a question yeah. quickly? Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you considering um, a, uh, an interaction that changes the world to be uh, writing long-term memory? Uh, wait, so so I think there are, there are two types of different actions, right? Grounding is changing the external environment and learning is changing the internal memories. Only when you are changing the internal memory, you are doing learning. So it's like if I if I just uh move this cup, right? It's not a form of learning. But that is that's grounding. That's grounding, yes. Okay. And if I decide that my name is different, is that memory or grounding? That's a good question, right? So uh I think it's a it's a kind of learning, right? So uh you update your in long term memory basically. Right? So uh imagine one day Joe Biden, you know, becomes the president, right? And it store this new knowledge in his mind, right? Joe Biden is now the president, right? It's a kind of learning, right? You you can use this update to the memory to help you make future decisions. And yeah, but also if you move the cup, you can update your memory to make future decisions. So where's the difference? What's the border between changing the world and changing your long term memory? That's a great question because you know you can also implement like a database as like an external external environment, right? Like Google is an external environment, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the boundary, right? That's a really good and tricky question. And uh, I don't think we, I have time to discuss that in detail now, but I have a detailed response in the papers beginning of uh, section seven. I encourage you to check it. Is there at least a good short answer? Or at the, least short answer is, uh, the short answer is uh, internal memory is something you can fully control. Whereas external environments, might not be something you can fully control. Think of Wikipedia, right? It's not an internal memory because other people can also write to it. And also, it depends on how intrinsically, you know, irreplaceable it is, right? If it's something plug and play, you can probably implement that as an environment. But you know, for humans, there's no choice. We have to have those memory models. Otherwise, we just can't function. So if it's fundamental to the functioning of the agent, then it's more likely to be internal rather than external. So rather than thinking about specific terminology about learning versus grounding, it would it make more sense to think of it as um, controllability over, as an individual over uh, a particular aspect of the world? Like yeah, so when you're designing the agent, I think the first question is you need to determine the boundary of what is internal, what is external. You need to set, you know, what are the memories and what are the external environments and what are their interfaces, right? And then you can define the connection space. Then you can define the decision making. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm gonna skip all the insights here. You can check out the paper. Uh, but uh, we list all the concrete future directions that you can you can work in this uh, 
field. And so if you want to publish paper, maybe you should check out this paper. Uh, but uh, to quickly summarize, you know, we have a very simple, I think elegant, and also, you know, uh, Coxi inspired kind of theory of language agents. But I think the meta level takeaway is, you know, all the new techniques, they can actually help solve new issues, old issues. And on the other hand, you know, all the old insights, they can guide new development. And I really like this synergy. Uh, cool. Uh, let's let's move to the second part about uh, evaluation. Uh, before that, any questions? Okay, uh, let's talk about evaluation, right? And uh, we know evaluation is a really important question for us who are playing with language models every day, right? So uh, one way to think of evaluation is there are only, there are, there are kind of four kind of, four types of you know benchmarks that you can possibly get, right? Uh, and uh, I think everybody would agree, you know, the best type of benchmark or task or evaluation that you want is you want a task that's really hard to solve, but easy to evaluate. That would be the goal for for all the evaluation, right? So what I mean by each type, right? For example, uh, we now are facing this situation, right? Something like glue or all the old existing LP tasks are becoming, you know, Easy to solve and easy to evaluate. Right? They have well defined metrics. They have they're easy to evaluate, but unfortunately, they're becoming easier and easier for better and better language models. Right. Uh, the second type, you know, is probably the worst situation. Right. It's like you don't want something that's easy to solve but kind of hard to evaluate. But uh, you would think nothing is like that. But uh, think of something like chatbot or text generation or writing a novel or writing a poem. Uh, you know, GPT-4 can do those things, obviously, and it's, it's doing pre pretty well, right? But uh, it turns out extremely hard to evaluate those things. Oftentimes, we have to rely on human judgment, right? Is this poem better than this poem or, or not? Or is this chatbot, you know, helpful? Or is this satisfying to you? It's kind of hard to evaluate because uh, you're relying on this very subjective human judgment, right? Uh, so obviously, we want hard to solve, easy to evaluate problems. And I think a typical, I think there are two typical uh, examples, right? For example, something like uh, AlphaGo, something like Go, right? Like those games, it has really simple rules, right? It's super easy to evaluate who wins or not, but uh, it's super hard to solve, right? So Go is hard for everyone else here. Uh, I think a more relevant example for NLP people like us is coding, right? I think coding is a great example of a good task for models because it's hard to code, but at the end of the day, you have a good evaluation metric, right? You just execute the code, you have some some unit test, and then if if the output matches, then it works. If not, then it doesn't match. You have this very concrete, very solid, and very simple and uh, good way to evaluate the system, and. Uh, and uh, obviously, there's the, the the fourth type of problems that are hard to solve and also hard to evaluate. And unfortunately, you know, I see a lot of recent engineering tasks. You know, people are trying to propose tasks for language agents. Many of them are falling into this category because, you know, you can do hard, you know, internet navigation or, you know, ro robotic manipulation or whatever. But at the end of the day, like evaluation is often as hard as solving the problem, if not harder. So at the end of the day, you might also need to, you know, show two trajectories to a human which is better, or show two trajectories to a GPT four with what is better, etc. So, so what is what is the criteria, right? What, what do we want for a new task? Like, what does it mean to be easy to evaluate? Uh, so I've 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 shown this example of coding, right? But I think the criteria we we should all agree on is we want something that is cheap, fast, and consistent. Uh, and maybe not too subjective, but we'll talk about that part later. And if we think about all, like, there are only kind of three ways that we can do evaluation in a very high level, right? So obviously the first step is to rely on human evaluation, 
that's like an answer to everything. For any task, you can define a human evaluation. And the good thing is you're, it's often the ground truth, right? It's often the definition of high quality, especially if you're something like open air, right? You, you get very high quality evaluation and uh, RRHF, whatever. But the problem is it's not affordable to most of us, right? It's, if you're not open air, it's, it's expensive and it's slow and uh, it's... Uh, you, 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 possibly, possibly, you, you cannot another, do this to your task. Sorry, quick. Yeah. Wanted to yeah. Say, another downside of human evaluation is that it is not necessarily consistent. Yes. Yes. Uh, we can have those tricks to impose extra consistency, but you know, uh, at the end of the human no. evaluation, it's super it's noisy true. and subjective. Yeah. Something is good to me, but maybe maybe bad to, bad to you. And uh, uh, it's a it's a useful thing if your end goal is to build systems that serve human users. Right? But uh, if you're just trying to develop methodology, it might not be the best option given that it's noisy and subjective. Uh, obviously, you know how yeah. things say. Yeah. Sorry. So. Along the same line, how do you distinguish consistency and subjectivity? Uh, I would say, I would say subjectivity leads to a lack of consistency, because you know different people have different opinions. When you collect those labels, they might not be consistent. Yeah, so my question is because in the last fight you said cheap, fast, consistent, and maybe subjectivity, and to me it seems like. Consistency and subject being or not being subject, if it's highly related. Yes. Was, yes, it, it is. It, it, it is related. But, but we will see. We will see next. You know, there could be, you know, you know, because another thing that we're using more and more frequently is we can use GPT four to do evaluation, right? Uh, and it turns out it's it's uh it's not consistent. And it's it's probably even lower lower quality than the human or something because, uh, uh. So so if you think about language model evaluation, right? So if you have tried that, you know, oftentimes there's hallucination and the quality is not very good, and uh, uh, it's somewhat more scalable in the sense that you know you can always just call GPT API. To get unlimited evaluation, even though it costs you money, but uh, it's easier than just hiring people to 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 prepare for evaluation every day, right? Uh, but but the point I want to make is, you know, if you look at human evaluation or language model evaluation, uh, the problem is, you know, oftentimes they're noisy and they're subjective and uh, they're they might not be consistent, right? So. If you think about all the good old tradition of NLP, right? Like a lot of our wisdom are spent into defining rules for defining metrics, right? So we have all those different metrics that are defined and validated and used, right? So my 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 point in this slide is in evaluating language agents, we should also think of smart ways to impose rule-based evaluation that are high quality if we design the right rules, leveraging the right domain priors. And they are obviously much more scalable than human and language model evaluation because they're consistent, they're free, they're fast, and they're unlimited. And uh, OK, so so two words, you know, evaluating language agents. I'm going to talk about, you know, three benchmarks that we recently proposed. And uh, uh, I'm going to go over that quickly. Uh, and they happen to fall into you know the category one two three of 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 the slide you know so this first benchmark I want to talk about is called Coley, and uh, and we know text generation is something typically easy to solve but hard to evaluate but uh, this benchmark turns out we make this interactive, agentic, and the reverse we make it hard to solve and easy to evaluate. And you know, there are some tasks that are already hard to solve and easy to evaluate, something like coding. And here, our insight is we should just make them interactive and we should make them also benchmark for agents. And that's the second benchmark, intercode. 
And the third example, uh, web shop, uh, because I talk about you know how web is a, typically a task that's hard to solve and hard to evaluate. Uh, I think the insight there is if you leverage the right domain priors, you can design rule based metrics that makes it hard to solve and easy to evaluate. So at the end of the day, you can turn you know all you know this one two three those three type of tasks all into the second type of task right hard to solve easy to evaluate. Obviously, if something is easy to solve, easy to evaluate, maybe maybe uh, it's already done. So, but for, for all other three type of tasks, there is a chance to transform them to good tasks for language agents. Okay, so let's talk about Kali first. It's a joint work with a lot of my colleagues from Princeton, and uh, uh, everybody should know what is a constraint text generation, right? So, uh, so for example, generate a sentence with with dog, with dog, frisbee, and throw as, as three words in the sentence, right? So you have some constraints and you want to generate some text that follow the constraint. Uh, it's a traditional and important NLP problem, but uh, uh, for example, this, but the problem is, you know, the prior benchmark are becoming too easy. Uh, so taking like a perspective of, of language agents and, uh, you know, we, we set a very ambitious goal. We want to generate a, we want to create a, new uh, benchmark for this old task that has diverse and arbitrarily hard constraints for language models, yet guaranteed to be solvable, right? So that, that, that follows a hard to solve kind of part. And you have this, and you, and you will have this automatic task construction and evaluation without any, almost without any human efforts. So basically, you can just construct a new benchmark in two days and you don't really need to hire Turkers. That's the easy to build part. And then, you know, uh, it's easy to build and easy to value. And also, we want this thing to be challenging for a lot of different reasons. We want it to challenge language understanding, generation semantic planning, logic reasoning, or semantic reasoning, and so on and so forth. So we set this ambitious goal. And turns out, you just need one core idea. You just leverage a very old idea called grammar. So to show what I mean, here is... Uh, uh, here is a grammar of the, so we, we build this grammar that specifies all the constraints that is possible in this uh, quality space. And it's like a context-free grammar. And uh, it's not very readable, I apologize for that, but uh, just some comments, right? So it only leverages very few concepts. You know, you have this concept of count, you have this concept of position, and you have this concept of level, and you have different levels, right? Character, word, sentence, paragraph, passage. But then you use compositionality of the grammar to yield a rich set of constraints, right? So for example, you can generate a paragraph with exactly four sentences, each with 10 to 15 words, or you can generate a sentence where you specify the first word to be something, the second word to be something, and the 10th word to be something, right? Or you can generate a paragraph that include this and that, but not that. Or you can generate a word with 15 letters, right? So there are a diverse set of constraints you can express through this uh, grammar. And notably, you know, this grammar can be extended to incorporate more concepts, right? Part of speech or sentiment or topic, but uh, we're just doing a very basic version yet. And we're showing this, even if you just have content position, you can build a lot of different constraints. And uh, it turns out to be hard for language models, right? So if you aggregate all, across all the constraints, even something like GPT-4 can only solve half of the constraints. Uh, all the open source models suffer. And uh, and it's it's not homogeneous, obviously. So some constraints are easy, some constraints are hard for GPT-4. And you know, you can even construct constraints that are super hard for GPT-4 that it only solves, you know, less than 0.5% of the time. So uh the point is you can make this arbitrarily hard and you can make it with ease because uh once you have this grammar, all you need to do as a human is you specify this constraint, and then uh, we have designed this automatic pipeline that extracts all the possible sentences or paragraphs or words from a, set, a, a text corpora, right? And then we have an automatic pipeline to render all the constraints into a prompt. And then you have this rule-based like compositional evaluation, right? So, it's super easy to evaluate because uh, it's compositional and uh, you just uh, you just have a couple of rules to evaluate. Obviously, you can 
incorporate uh, further evaluations for fluency or whatever. It's very plug and play. But the point is, uh, this pipeline is super automatic. And uh, if you want to construct your own constraint text generation benchmark, you can do this within half a day. And uh, and uh, yeah, and 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 to relate that to language agents, right? So I think a very a very like uh, underexplored thing, you know, for all the old traditional NLP tasks is feedback helps, right? For example, if I want to generate something like a word with ten letters where I specify the same, it's hard even for GPT four or ChatGPT. But if you give feedback, right? So for example, hey, you only have to nine letters instead of 10. You have this part right, this part right, but this part wrong, this part wrong. You, if you have those automatic feedback, that will make you know this system work much better, right? If you look at this figure, like if you have a couple of rounds of feedback, it will improve the performance significantly. Obviously there's still a lot of room for improvement for more fancy agent methods, but uh, uh, feedback helps. Uh, a lot of findings are omitted here, like check the paper. Uh, Cool. So, so one question. Um, when you said your results are not homogeneous, um, did you have some insights that you can quickly share? I don't know if it's already in the paper, but do you have any insights you can share about what type, like whether the, the lack of homogeneity other fields, um, particular tasks that are difficult, and whether you see homogeneity across models? So, like if constraint type, one of the constraint types. Um, that GPT-4 fails, is it consistently bad for all the other models, or do you see just things being all over the place? Um, and so yes. You see yes. yes, those yes. are great <laughs> questions. And uh, we do have a lot of interesting findings in the paper. Uh, just to give one example. So one thing we find is that uh, it's really, really hard if you specify the position of you know the second letter or the 10th letter or the fourth sentence. If it's not the first, and if, if it's not a lot, then the problem will become significantly harder. So if you look at the word zero two constraint, right? If you specify the third letter or something, then it just makes it super hard. And it's kind of intuitive because, uh, you know, those language models don't have a good way to keep track of the position uh, naively. Uh, uh, there are many, many interesting findings, uh, but I, I, I guess I have to move on to talk about the other. I'll check it out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. One question. Yeah, one question. Uh, how do you, uh, you were talking about extending it to sentiment, fluency, parts of speech. Like, how do you see that? Uh, like, I'm able to like make that map. So uh, I see that, I feel like when you make the constraints more challenging, that makes the evaluation challenging. So how do you go from yeah, and incorporate these additional constraints. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, for example, if you want to incorporate part of speech into this grammar, right? Basically, for this base constraint, the third equation, you just add, you know, something like uh, the 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 position, the the, the peel, part of speech of this of this saying of this word should be something or not. You can do something. So basically, this each each of the constraints is a logical expression, right? So you can just augment that with some new forms of uh, 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 constraints, and 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 the good thing is that you can leverage off the shelf, you know, part of speech or sentiment models. So uh, it shouldn't be too hard to evaluate. What about so you can more specify something more? like yeah, yeah. You can about something like the third word is very Yeah. What about something more semantic, like I mean, fluency or sentiment? Yeah. So you can you similarly you can also specify you know the third sentence should be sad, sad rather than happy. And you can you can readily do that because yeah. you have off the shelf sentence sentiment classification yeah. model. Then you can just specify, you know, either the third paragraph should be happy or you know the second or or the second, you know, sentence or whatever. It's, it's all got it. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this is an example of you know how we can transform our typical traditional NLP task into this, you know, interesting task for language agents. Um, then comes code, right? Uh, one thing I'm really surprised at is, you know, all those coding benchmarks nowadays are sick to sick. 
you know, you have instruction and then you generate a program and then you, you, you have a metric. Whereas as humans, we fundamentally program in a very interactive and incremental and grounded way, right? You don't just generate a sequence and that's it, right? You, you write some initial code, you, you maybe execute, and then you, you get some feedback from execution. You, you revise the code, you do this like multiple iterations, right? So the, the point is, you know, we have all those static NL2 code benchmarks, but uh, it doesn't make sense for humans because we incremental, we fundamentally code in a very interactive way, right? And, uh, and, and now we are having some interactive or execution-based coding methods, right? Uh, for example, like you can execute and then you generate a hundred programs, you can based on the execution, like decide what is the most likely program or whatever. There are all those methods, but uh, there's not a standard benchmark that that just make interaction a very fundamental uh, part of the task. So that's why we introduced this like work called intercode. And uh, and the idea is it's really simple, right? So if you think about like uh, so in intercode, each task is it's kind of like a standard RL environment. It's like interactive, right? So if you have an initial instruction, you can you can generate some code, right? And then the code will be executed and give you some result. So if you think about, so we did Python and Bash and uh, SQL, but if you think about this Bash example, right? It's just similar to a text game where you're doing a terminal, right? You have uh, you, you have some commands and then you generate some outputs, you, you generate some commands, you generate some outputs, so far and so forth. And and the point is, this is much easier to, to solve tasks. So for example, for this particular bash task, you can imagine there is a way to write a very complicated bash command to solve this in, in, in one term. But uh, it's just much easier if you just first, OK, I look at what are the files in this folder, right? And then, and then, and then I can do things accordingly, adaptively. That will make things much easier. So you have. So intercode basically turns all the existing, you know, we, we, we use some old, you know, existing coding benchmark, we design some new coding benchmark, we turn them into the standard gym-like R environment. And uh, it has multiple benefits, right? First, it's safe and reproducible, right? You have the sandbox and it makes sure, you know, this Docker thing, uh, it makes sure you, you can reproduce. Uh, it unlocks some new tasks that are fundamentally interactive, which we'll show later. Uh, and it unlocks some new evaluations. For example, for Bash, previously all the Bash tasks they can only rely on surface form, you know, program match. But now we have this environment we can do interaction with it. We can do execution. We can actually evaluate those models based on the the the, the a grounded execution instead of just surface form uh, match. And obviously we unlock new methods. Right. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the methods in detail, but you can imagine there are many agents that you can try. We try some simple ones, and we do a lot of experiments with interesting findings. But to 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 condense, you know, interactive is just much better than six to six. If you look at the figure right now, even if you have a very simple way of incorporating interaction as execution, it just performs much better than six to six. And uh, different different you know agents, different interactive methods have different trade offs. And obviously, there's still a large room for improvement. So I think coding is really a exciting frontier if you want to build language agents, because it provides a really good evaluation and it's still hard to solve. Uh, just just to briefly talk about you know the the, the all, some of the future work, right? So, uh, I feel like now we're stepping from coding more to more complicated software engineering. Right? Coding usually you know something a human evolved. You, you you have like a line of problem and then you write 10 lines of code to solve it. But now you can, so recently we have this paper probably released next week. We can, with social agents, we can do more complicated things, right? For example, uh, we can do GitHub uh, issue, right? You have this very complicated code base, right? And it has like an issue you need to solve and you, to solve it, you don't just write 10 lines of code, right? You actually need to, interact with a bunch of different files, execute it, try unit tests, you know, change some of the files, try it again. You know, just like how real world software engineers solve a real world issue, you know, in a very complicated way, 
using reasoning, using acting, and so on and so forth. And we introduced this new benchmark called SwayBench that's kind of like a SQL to intercode. And what we show is if you just use SIG to SIG, it just doesn't work because you have this super long context that is hard to fit into the language model and it's too complex, too complex to fit into the uh, language model to understanding. And uh, even something like, you know, GPT-4 can only solve, you know, 1% of all the GitHub issues and they're usually the easiest and shortest issues. And something like Cloud2, you know, optimized for long form, it will do better. But uh, 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 I think that's also like a frontier of uh, uh, language agents. Uh, do I still have like five or 10 more minutes to talk about WebShop or should I just wrap up? We can definitely run over a couple of minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay. So let me let me let me just take a extra five to ten minutes to to, to do it. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, so last thing I want to talk about is web, and uh, this is this this is actually the oldest work of all the work I talk about is it begins in twenty twenty one, which is you know Asian time compared to all the agents nowadays, and uh, I'm gonna skip over all the prior work and uh, I'm just gonna talk about what is web shop. So. Uh, WebShop is just a complicated kind of real world web shopping task where you have this web shop website that's kind of similar to Amazon, and all the instructions are like, I'm looking for this product that has those attributes, or options, or price, or color, and you need to find me this this uh, product. And if you're an agent, you want to solve this task, you will need to you know open different pages, you you search different queries, you need to click different buttons, you need to read different materials and you need to do decision making, you need to explore, right? Should I uh, come into this current product or should I go back or should I you know, search again? You need to make all those decision making. It's kind of similar to how humans shop, you know? Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, I shop on Amazon for two hours because it's hard. It's a hard decision making problem. So uh, why shopping is a really scalable environment with rich dynamics and scalable items, right? If you want to make this environment larger, you can script a million products or script 10 million products from Amazon, right? It will just make this larger. Uh, it's a very scalable task in the sense that it has a well-defined problem and it's possible for automatic reward synthesis. We'll show you in the next slide. And there's some interesting challenges, right? It's multimodal. It has interesting decision-making and so on and so forth. It's hard for humans, so it's, it must be hard for language agents. Uh, how do we build this, right? So. The, the hard engineering part is the easy conceptual part, right? You just script a lot of products from Amazon. You build this, uh, you, you script those attributes from, from those products. You build a synthetic website with both text interface and uh, like uh, browser interface. Uh, the, the, the engineering, the easy engineering part, but the hard conceptual part is uh, you need to, you know, paraphrase those, some of the products into uh, instruction. And you need to design this uh, reward function. You know, suppose I find this product, but my goal product is actually looks like this, and the instruction looks like this. How do I calculate the reward? Because we're constraining to you know products with particular, we're constraining to instructions with particular types or attributes or prices or whatever. You can have a very faithful like a uh, robust reward calculation and. Uh, we we did that with human, you know, validation and it kind of works. And it reminds you of, you know, all the good old fashioned NLP tasks where you define a heuristic rule metric and uh, you verify it's, it's good for humans. Uh, and then it's good because now you have this large scale environment and you have this automatic reward. You can do imitation learning, you can do prompting, you can do reinforcement learning, you can do a lot of different things. We did a lot of experiments, but I'm gonna skip over everything just talk about this one thing. Uh, Seem to real transfer is usually hard for RL. If you if you train in say gym, it's hard to work on real robots. But if you're working with language agents instead of RL agents, <laughs> yep, yep, uh, you have a chance to 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 more easily seem to real transfer, right? So here we show. If you train an agent on, on, on web shop, it's easier to transfer to Amazon because language literally bridges the gap between between those two environments, and uh, uh, that's another benefit of uh, language agents. So to quickly summarize, you know, it is 
the first large scale realistic web interaction benchmark is we did this in 2021 and no one cared about that. But this year, I think there's group, there's like a lot of interest start to pour into this domain. You know, you have a lot of different works. Uh, and uh, I think it's great because even if it's a synthetic web, web page, you can do similar transfer. And there is a way to to use self-supervision or model supervision to provide a very scalable reward. So here, we're not using much to, to build the evaluation, right? We're using this extremely simple concept of, you know, if I specify a start and an end, if I start, specify a product, and then it's kind of like QA, right? You first find an answer, and then you try to find a way to lead to the answer, right? That's like a very free, very free supervision. And we also make use of all the, you know, off the shelf NLP models, right? You can, we use text mining to extract all the attributes of the product, but you can also use, you know, reliable off the shelf sentiment classification to, 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 to like classify sentiments from reviews or summarization models or whatever. You can use all those free model supervision to build more face for reward signals instead of just letting GPT-4 handle everything, right? GPT-4 write a instruction, GPT-4, tell me if it's good or not. You can use those supervision to, to build more phase four, better, you know, easier, cheaper, more scalable uh, evaluation. And one thing I think is pretty cool is, you know, once you have those like uh, kind of like free supervision, you can do individual human fine tuning on top of that. Uh, and obviously now there are some new benchmarks, right? Uh, like web web arena, you know, this is using this idea of like robust evaluation and it's extending to more web pages, and people are starting to compile compile different benchmarks into a big benchmark, you know, evaluating different performances. So I think there's a lot of progress in this evaluation direction. Uh, to 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 summarize, uh, language agents they are a new and different kind of artificial intelligence agents that are reliant on large language model reasoning. And hopefully through Koala, you have realized you know, how this is different from RL agents, how this is different from classical planning agents, so on and so forth. It is different. And uh, we have a lot of ideas and hypes, but we lack series and benchmarks. So to formulate language agents, I think we can use classical insights from AI and Coxar. To evaluate language agents, we should use real-world interactive tasks that are often overlooked, right? You know, something like coding or web or whatever. They're not traditional AI problems, but I think now it's a great time to study them and they are of great practical importance. And we have talked about some insights to how to build good matrix. Uh, and on a you know, meta level, I think, that's also where, you know, academia could uniquely help or help most. Because uh, oftentimes people complain, you know, now even a high school student can prompt GPT-4 and write paper, like, what makes us different, right? And I think an answer to that is, you know, all the training of, you know, from, from, from classical series can help us formulate better series of what's going on. And all the classical training of, you know, how to build tasks, how to, do faithful evaluation, how to care about all the experiment details, that could make us uh, build good benchmarks, right? And uh, that's something we have like a comparative advantage over industry or high school students or whatever. Uh, and and if you want to like think about more about future directions for language agents, I highly encourage you to check out the Koala paper, especially section six. It's just called Future Directions. And uh, I think there are like already like 20 ideas that you can publish paper around. Uh, chat with me in the afternoon or email me. Uh, and uh, I also want to hear what you think about this direction and what you think is the future direction. So uh, if you have any feedback about this talk or this direction about my work, I highly encourage you to to, to give me some feedback through through this webpage. Uh, and thanks. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Junior, for an amazing talk. Um, I can't wait to check out the Koala paper for myself and look into the Section 6 results. So, um, and also look forward to talk with you uh, one on one later on this afternoon. Uh, it's a shame we couldn't have you in person, but hopefully we'll cross roads again sometime in the future. And then we hope to show you around ISI. Uh, anyways, thanks again for everyone.